for our pastoral prayer time this morning. I want to pray that we would be a witnessing church in all the activity that we have, that it would be our desire and our hearts and our effort that we would point people to the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that he offers, that we wouldn't be so busy that we miss that, and we wouldn't be distracted that we just work, but that we would be a witnessing church, not simply from the message, but that you and I, us as individuals, would point people to Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have told us to go and preach the gospel. You have told us that faith faith comes through hearing. You have told us, God, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if Jesus Christ is lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. Father, we pray this morning that we would be a witnessing church. God, we desire to be a loving church and a serving church and a helping church and a merciful church, a gracious and forgiving church. But Father, in the midst of all of that, may the reason, may the source be proclaimed. May the name of Jesus be shared and told And would people come to know him? God, we pray that you would create life change in the the lives of people. We pray, God, that we would be so much more, so much other than just folks that go to church and try to be good people. Father, I pray that we would be beyond that in the sense that we are Jesus' people. In the sense that Christ has done a work on us from the inside. God, make us a witnessing church to the fact that Jesus saves and changes lives and forgives sins. That Jesus loves people who feel like they don't deserve to be loved. And he welcomes people into the family of God. God, help us to proclaim the message that anybody can become a child of God. Oh, Father, make us a witnessing church. God, make us parents and grandparents witnesses to our children and grandchildren. God, make us that have neighbors, make us witnesses to our neighbors. God, those of us that have open doors to have people in our lives, make us witnesses there as well. Father, would you use followers of Christ to create more followers of Christ? Father, we pray that this South Louisville area, this Fairdale community would be pointed to Jesus and the loving forgiveness that he offers through us. We ask for you to do that work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, turn to the Bible to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We finished up chapter 4. Moving right along, progressing, advancing. And now we get to chapter 5. Jesus is uh, doing what he does. A study of his life is brilliant. It's fascinating. It is uh, attractive. We want to know more about it. He, He moves in ways that only he can do. He encounters people in ways that only he can. And it's good for us to read it and study it. We get to chapter 5, and Jesus is going to do yet again what he's able to do. He's about to heal a man. He's about to do a miracle. If you're keeping count, this will be the third sign in the Gospel of John. We were told of the first sign. We were told of the second sign. Now, this is the third sign, although it doesn't say that this is the third sign, okay? If you're following along with that, I'm not going to hit that too hard, but these are these signs that John keeps pointing out, these absolute miracles that Jesus does to show that he's God, okay? That will help you know. I also want to remind you that John is written, it tells us this in chapter Chapter 20, John wrote this gospel for people to believe. It's not just a history book, although it's a good history book, right? It's not just a story, although it's a great story. This book was written so that you would believe in Christ. That you would say, man, I just can't get around it. It's convincing to me. He is something. He is who he says he is. And I believe it now. That's why it was written. I want to move you toward that. May God's spirit work in you and cause you to believe. I hope that you will. I want to remind you here today that nobody's just born believing. We're all a work in progress. We're all all along that road. We're all on this journey. 
And so you do have to come to believe. And so I want to encourage you here today to trust in Christ. Say, I want to be a Christian. I like the, the, the wording that was used during the baptism. Followers of Christ. We take his word seriously. Become a follower of Christ. John 5 is another step in that direction, and we think you will be blessed from this passage today. But John John 5 also takes the gospel of John and moves it in a little bit of a different direction. You and I are about to embark on the next several chapters, at least through chapter 8. Some people say through chapter 10, in this big uh, ongoing dialogue and uh, dissension between Jesus and those that do not like him. Jesus is going to continue proving that he is God, God's son that came from heaven to earth to be the savior. He's just going to keep proving that. And the people that don't like that are just going to keep trying to oppose it. And so the gospel of John really ratchets up here. And it gets intense. There is some fighting. And wouldn't you know it, it's not the poor and needy. It's not the outcasts who are in disbelief of Jesus claiming to be God. It's none other than the religious folks. It's the ones that say they know God but really don't. It's the ones that are really good. It's the ones who think that they are the good ones in society. It's the ones that think they've been raised well and do things right. And they're not the problem around here. Those are the ones that have a problem with Jesus. These next several weeks, these next several chapters are going to do a number on our pride. Our study of Jesus over the next several chapters are going to do a number on our self-righteousness. And we may not be the most self-righteous people in the world, and I I do pray that we're not. But there's a little bit of self-righteousness in all of us where we think we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're good people because of what we do. And in humility, we need to know that we need a Savior as much as anybody else. You don't come to God because you've got it all figured out. You come to God because you need him. And these next several chapters are going to really, really, really hit us hard on dealing with that. I hope you'll saddle up. I hope you'll uh, stay engaged, be here as often as you can to, to keep up. And even if you can't be here, then follow along and keep up with this because that's where this is going. Jesus is about to conflict with the religious people. But in our passage today, particularly we're going to look at the first 18 verses. It's not like this story ends and verse 19 starts a new one. It's ongoing. But today we're going to try to cover the first 18 verses. And in our passage today, it, the first half is just this awesome scene of a miracle. And then it gets off track. And the conversation becomes something else. And that happens sometimes, doesn't it? In Bible study, somebody asks a question and Next thing you know, we're off and running, and we're way down a rabbit trail. We're talking about something I had never thought about. And a lot of times I'll speak up and say, you know, I I wasn't prepared today to talk about that. But if we're going down that trail, then let's go down that trail, right? And a good 10 minutes later, after we've had a long discussion about something that nobody thought we'd be talking about, we'll go, how did we get to that point? And then somebody with enough sense will go, well, remember, you were talking about this. And then we steer it back. That's what happens today with these Pharisees. They're going to so miss the point of Jesus being awesome, they're going to be way distracted. It it reminds me of what it's like at a dinner table if you have kids. We try to get to the dinner table as much as we can. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we just can't make it work. Sometimes it's 10 o'clock and we're we're literally serving dinner at 10 o'clock on a school night. But that's the way it goes and we're at the dinner table. But Val will have worked so hard at 9, 9.30 to try to put together a dinner and we're eating dinner and all seven of us are there and we're talking and it's going well. And I got to admit, for as uh, frustrating as those meals might be at times because kids are all worked up, getting the family around the dinner table is so nice. I don't usually have many practical tips, but if you can get the family around the dinner table, try to do it. Try to do it. You'll be blessed. You'll long for more of those. But an ordinary dinner table meal for us would be we're sitting down and Val's cooked us up this great meal and some of us were devouring it and I can clean my plate usually in about a minute or two. I need to slow down with that. But we'll look over and we'll see that one of our kids isn't eating. 
And so that upsets you if you've been working all day and your kid's not eating. You say, what, why aren't you eating? I say, I'm not hungry. Oh, what, how are you not hungry? You had lunch at school and now we haven't eaten? How, how are you not hungry? Another kid will tell on them and say, well, when I got home, they were eating a bag of Cap'n Crunch on the couch. And so you say, did you eat a bag of Captain Crunch on the couch? And so I start to like lean into getting on. You can't do that. First of all, that's a breakfast meal. You can't have that for dinner. It's not good for you. And then another kid will speak up and say, yeah, Dad, but you know how good Captain Crunch is, man. It's like, I mean, I was watching a video on YouTube and, and a top five video of the greatest cereals, and everybody has Captain Crunch in the top five. I mean, it's just so good. And so then somebody else will go, well, what were the other five? And so then you're like, well, see, they had Cap'n Crunch, and they had Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and they had some Lucky Charms. You had to go Frosted Flake, and you're like, really? And so you get into that, and we're engaging about that, and next thing you know, I'm like, well, why aren't you eating your dinner? And I like, well, remember, because they ate that Captain Crunch. And so I'm like, well, yeah, you can't do that. Not to mention, have you brushed your teeth since you ate that Captain Crunch? Because that is nothing but sugar, and that's going to mess your teeth up and all of that. And somebody will go, oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, you got a dentist appointment tomorrow. <laughs> what time is it? Because I... We got other stuff going on. I don't think we'll be able to make that dinner point. Okay, well, I can call and, call and reschedule it. Yeah, well, I think, I think there's my, maybe a fee if you reschedule it. And, and 10 minutes later, it's now way past. Our food's getting cold. Some of the kids are done. And somebody will say, how do we get to talking about dentist appointments? And I know that happens sometimes with you all, doesn't it? it happens in our Bible studies a lot. But we say that's okay. We want to talk about what you're thinking. It happens here in John chapter 5 over moral reasons. And it's really ugly on behalf of the religious people. Read with me, if you will, from John chapter 5, 1 through 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been invalid, who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, That man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. It doesn't end there, it continues going, but today we're going to stop at verse 18. What a story. There's similar stories like this one. This is the only place in the Bible where we get this exact one. There's similar stories like this where somebody is handicapped, in great need physically, and Jesus heals them. We read that passage earlier of Jesus healing very similar thing. He said, go, your sins are forgiven. Says it a different way, but Jesus healed them too. There are more coming up in the Gospel of John. You and I are to know without any question, Jesus is God and he can do this sort of thing. As I said in the baptism, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. He can do whatever he wants. 
He has the power to do that. And we see it in this passage again. It's brilliant. It's fascinating. We are thankful that God wrote this down for us by way of John, the author of this gospel, the apostle. You and I are encouraged to put our faith in the rock-solid one, Jesus, who can do this. Who heals people, who speaks to 38 years of being limited and an invalid and handicapped and body parts that can't work the way uh, the average person can. Jesus is able to speak directly to it and change it. You today ought to be encouraged that your faith is in that Christ who does that sort of thing. That's who we follow. I want to give you four observations from our passage today. For you kids that are using the listening page, this will help you. Number one, the man was helpless and needy. That's pretty obvious. The man was helpless and needy. We're told that there was a feast, so Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and there in Jerusalem, he's up here by the sheep gate, and there's a, there's a pool there. It's called Bethesda. Now, there's a lot of discussion about Bethesda, Bethsaida. A lot of different translations word that a little bit differently. It's all the same place. We got this detail here that there's five roofed colonnades. There's some, there's some, some outdoor shelters around these pools. And there were a multitude of invalids. A lot of handicapped people would come to this place. Some were blind. Some were lame. uh, Some were paralyzed. And there was one particular man laying there who had been an invalid for 38 years. We don't know a lot about him. We don't know if he was 78 years old. And so this happened to him when he was about 32 years old. And so for the last 38 years he's been like this. Or we don't know if he was 38 years old and he was born this way and he's been dealing with it. We don't have a lot of detail here about this man. But for 38 years, he has been in this position. We don't seem to think that he's been laying there beside that pool for 38 years. We don't know how long he'd been there. But the man has been suffering with this disability for a long time, 38 years. He clearly wants to get healed. healed. That's why he's beside the pool. But he can't. It doesn't happen. So he's helpless and he's needy. At this point, at the end of verse 5, we have not been told that Jesus is there to meet him. That will happen in verse 6, which I'm about to get to. The, The gospel tells us about this man who is helpless and needy. And there's not a whole lot to be said there except we can feel for him. And if you've ever dealt with a disability, something that greatly limits you, you may be able to relate. If you've never dealt with one, you may be thinking, I, I, I can't even imagine what it must have been like. But with a very basic reading, you and I know he couldn't do anything about his issue but he wanted to see it fixed. He was helpless and needy. J.C. Ryle, just commenting on, his position, commenting on his position, says, you'll like this. It'll paint a picture for you. For 38 weary summers and winters, he had endured pain and infirmity. He had seen others healed at these waters of Bethesda, and he had seen others going home rejoicing because of it. But for him, there had been no healing. He was friendless, he was helpless, and he was hopeless. He lay near the wonder-working waters, but he derived no benefit from them. Year after year passed away and left him still uncured. No relief or change for the better seemed likely to come except from the grave. I think that's fair. It doesn't sound like an exaggeration. It's an honest assessment of what this man was dealing with. The first five verses of our passage here show us that this man was helpless and needy physically. But as we're going to see, and my second point is going to lead into, you and I are to recognize sometimes physically we're in that position, but we are all helpless and needy spiritually. It's not a stretch to understand that we can relate to this guy in this way. Later in our passage, we're going to see Jesus bring up sin in this man's life. And I know there's a lot of people who would say, what's sin got to do with any of this, God? Why'd you have to go there? 
And one of the reasons is sin's got to do with everything in our lives. But another reason is because that's how you and I connect to this man. There's a real tendency or, 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 or option that you would read this and go, I get handicapped people have their own struggles, but that's not me. God's word wants you and I to feel that we are helpless and needy before him. How are you and I going to be forgiven of our sins? What's going to satisfy us on the inside? You cannot work yourself into goodness. You certainly cannot work yourself into godliness. Heaven is not for those who've earned it. Heaven is for those who've received the gift. Number one, he was helpless and needy. But before I go on to my second point into verse 6, I wonder how closely you've been following along because you may have noticed that in the first five verses, there are only four verses. Did anybody notice that? There's no verse 4 here, at least not in my ESV. Did you catch that? It goes from verse 3 to verse 5, and I got a little footnote that tells me that, a, that, that, that there was a verse 4 And here's what it said. This is not in the Bible. This is a footnote in this English translation. Verse 4 says, For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was healed of whatever disease he had. But it's not in there. Verse 4 is not in there. So why? Well, this is actually a little bit more common than you realize. There are a handful of places in your Bible where this type of thing happens. When the Bible was first translated into English, they used these original manuscripts that had been found that had it in there. That was over 400 years ago. Since then, many, many more manuscripts have been recovered and found through archaeology that are earlier than those. And the earliest manuscripts don't have verse 4. And so that leads us with pretty level-headedness to conclude that somebody added that verse in later. There are all sorts of notes written about the Bible, and I guess if you're writing down with pen and paper that sometimes they get shoved in there, sometimes uh, unintentionally and maybe sometimes with corruption and intentionally. You know, I, I don't know. But the easy explanation is that in the earliest manuscripts that have been found in the world do not have verse 4. Now, here today, there's not really a whole lot of controversy with with this one because verse 7 kind of gives us a glimpse of what verse 4 is saying, whether it's uh, right or not. Verse 7 gives you an idea. So what's what's the situation here with this pool? Why are there all these people with disabilities sitting around this pool? What's what's so big about that, right? Well, look at verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. So apparently, at some time, the water gets stirred up. It could be that there's some creeks or some rivers that flow into that. It could be a natural pool, something like that. But apparently, it could be supernatural, I don't know. But at some point, the water gets stirred up. And occasionally, when that water gets stirred up, The first person into the water gets healed. Now, I can't explain it. I don't really know. And there isn't much out there that tells us it's not the main point of this passage. You and I can't get distracted by that. I gave an illustration earlier about getting distracted. We can't get distracted by this, but that's what it sounds like, right? Verse 7 is Scripture. Verse 7 is in the Bible. But that's what it sounds like. And so this man can never quite get in. I mean, he's 38 years of this, and he's trying to get in. And every time he's about to get in, somebody else has already got in, and they are healed, or maybe they are healed, but it never happens for him. That's part of his discouragement. That's part of his frustration. That's part of his sadness and his loneliness. There's been, in 38 years, there's never been nobody to help him. No friend has come along and said, hey, I want to get you right here on the edge. I'm going to tell all those guys, hey, he's been waiting, and we're going to get you in there. Today's your day, buddy. That's never happened for him? Nope, never happened for him. But the point here for verse 4 is that it's not in there. But what we have is a footnote telling us, or if you have a King James Version, maybe it's in there. What we have going on here is is sounds like pretty reasonable to what you would reasonably think from verse 7. Let's not get distracted by that. The reason why they're all gathered by this pool is because there's a chance. There's an opportunity, small one, but there is. 
for them to be healed if they were to get in the water, when that water stirred up, and when the miraculous healing happens. But this guy keeps missing it. Number one, he was helpless and needy. Number two, he was hopeful and desperate. For you kids using the listening page, that's number two. He was hopeful and he was desperate. Look at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now, Jesus is just in Jerusalem. There's a lot of people there. But Jesus has found this guy. The Bible tells us that Jesus saw him lying there, but Jesus knew that he had already been there a long time. We've already seen this as a theme in John, haven't we? Jesus knows everything. We've seen this, right? Remember Philip and Nathaniel and under the fig tree, I saw you? Chapter 1. You remember the woman at the well, chapter 4, where she said, hey, he told me everything about me. This man knows everything I've ever done. Jesus does know everything about you and everything you've ever done. I, I don't know where you were last evening, if you mowed the grass or sat on the front porch, if you went for a walk or went out to eat or whatever you do, but Jesus saw it and knows it. He's like that. He knows every single thing that we do. We need this big view of Jesus. John is showing this over and over again. It's like one of those little sub storylines that's going on through John. He knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. Now, he doesn't just know like a GPS where you're at, but he, he knows and sees and feels. He understands. And so in compassion, he says to this man, do you want to be healed? That's an odd question. You would think he does. The only reason he's sitting there is he's hoping to get healed. That's why I say he's hopeful. He's not hopeful that it's going to happen necessarily, but he's hopeful that it could happen. He's hopeful enough that he's sitting there by it, waiting for some chance. He's been handicapped like this for 38 years. In verse 7, we see his desperation. He's hopeful, that's why he's there. He's desperate, look what he says. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up and while I am going, another steps down before me. I don't know if he's upset or crying or mad or angry, but it's not working. I'm this close to getting up and walking, but it will not work, and so he's desperate. If somebody would just help me in this way, I would get there. He's hopeful, and he's desperate. These first two points come together nicely for us, I think, as we observe what's going on with this guy. He's helpless. He can't do anything about it. He's needy. He needs something to be done. He's hopeful because there is a chance of healing right there in that stirred up water. He's desperate for it to get done. He doesn't have any other prospects or, or, op or, 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 or hope of what it might be. It's just in this. Helpless, needy, hopeful, and desperate. When we lean on our own selves and hope that <clears throat> our own goodness, or our own living, or our own works will satisfy God. We're very similar to this man. 38 years and no healing, and yet he's still on that same train of thought. The Bible says, not by works, not by works. When you and I start to think about God and his mercy and God and his judgment, God and his attention toward us, may you get rid of, may you abandon the thinking that you're fine and that you're okay and that you're good. May uh, words like this help you. You may only hear these words at church, I understand that, but may they serve you well in that spiritually you and I are helpless and needy. We are hopeful, but we're desperate before God. We need him to do something for us. These first seven verses paint a picture for us of a man sitting beside a pool, ready to be healed, but cannot find it. Many a people await standing before God, ready for heaven, but will not trust in Christ. Would you believe today that John is telling us this story about how awesome Jesus is? Not so that you and I would get in a big work up over verse 4 or about healing at a pool or how that pool actually worked. But so that down the road when he dies on the cross, you'd say he did it for me. John wrote this story 
so that a few chapters later, as that man hangs on the cross, you would say, that was for me. I need that. I need that. There's the answer to me. There's the answer to my life. There's the answer to my problems. That cross of Christ is the answer to me being helpless. It's the answer to me being needy. It's the answer to the hope that I'm looking for but can't find. It's the answer to the desperation, to the frustration inside of me, to my moral emptiness, to my self-righteousness. The cross of Christ where my Savior died is what I need for forgiveness. One other thing to point out here in these first two observations is notice that it is completely Jesus here taking the initiative. I don't want us to go too far down this road, but we we have to see it. There's nothing here that shows us that the man was seeking Jesus. He doesn't even seem to have known who Jesus is or was. After the fact, in our next verses, you're going to see that they're like, who did this to you? And he's like, I I don't know. He doesn't even know him. It's It's an odd part of the story. There are many handicapped people here too. The Bible tells us that there were lots of them, a multitude of them it says. And yet it was Jesus who found this one guy who sought him out. There is a reminder here, as one commentator points out, that Jesus is far more ready to save than man is to be saved. Jesus is far more willing to do good than man is to receive it. And I want to ask you here today, under the preaching of the word of God, are you sensing that God is doing that to you? This is the way God is designed for his word to work. When the gospel is preached, when the word of God is proclaimed, God goes to work on us and the Holy Spirit is invisible. But we sit there hearing the word of God in a collection of other believers and we think, man, he's speaking directly to me. And I'm not speaking directly to you. I haven't really thought about any of you all in preparation for this sermon. The only thing I was really nervous about today was a baptism. I haven't thought about who would be here or not. But God works through his word. And in a very similar way that the Lord Jesus Christ, in the midst of all these different invalids, found this guy and has a conversation with him. Hey, do you want to be healed? You may be sitting here today going, I've been thinking about life and eternity. I've been thinking about I'm getting older. I've been thinking about my sins and and the frustrations in my life. And would you hear today that the Lord Jesus Christ will forgive you of all your sins if you will trust in him. If you'll become a believer in Christ. God sent his son to die for you. Number one, this man was helpless and needy. Number two, he was hopeful and desperate. Number three, we see that he was healed and confident. Look with me at verse eight. Jesus said to him, and this is the strongest verse of all, get up, take up your bed and walk. Who has the power to do that? If he's not God, this is a bad scene, isn't it? This is some bullying on the school playground to the handicapped kid, isn't it? If this isn't the Lord Jesus Christ and God, this is really, really bad. You better not walk around to somebody that's in a wheelchair and say to them, get up, why don't you get up? It's really bad to treat somebody that way. Unless he has the ability to do it, to bring it about, to bring it to pass, to accomplish it, to do this miracle, he ought to never speak this way. But we're not talking about any old guy. We're talking about the one and only, the king of kings, the one with all the authority, When he says to 38 years, get up and walk, guess what happens? They get up and walk. Because Jesus is the Son of God. Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now if we were to stop right there. It would be the nicest little passage, wouldn't it? That's so sweet. We love that one. Glory to God, the power of God working in Jesus. But that's not it. We haven't gotten to the religious people yet. And I tell you what, sometimes when religion is focused and is focused on what God and his character is like, it is life-giving and refreshment. And I hope you're experiencing that here. I hope that we're all on guard against legalism. And so that church is helpful to you, refreshing to you. Hope you're glad to be here even today. 
But as we also know, sometimes when religious people get involved with things and they are self-centered and more concerned about themselves and their own ways and their own rights and they ain't actually looked to the cross of Christ in quite some time and they have lost sight, religious people can become a drag. And this passage happens just like this. Verse 9 says, at once the man was healed, he took up his bed and walked. Everybody should be going, wow, praise the Lord. And look what John writes in the very next sentence. Now that day was the Sabbath. And if you're focused on the miracle and the healing, you'd be saying, so what? Praise the Lord. But look what happens. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. And it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. You talk about a bad mood, a bad attitude, a Debbie Downer, a bad mood Betty, a rain on your parade. I'm talking, this is horrible. This man has been sitting there for 38 years. We can hardly relate to his level of depression because of it. He just vented in a statement to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's up walking. It's a miracle. How? How's it work? How do your muscles even have strength? How do you know how to walk? Like, there's so many questions. Until the religious Pharisees come along, and it's like, you're not allowed to do that. You're, you're breaking the law, buddy. I hate to tell you. It's not a good thing. You're in trouble. God's mad at you. You can go to hell for that. It's, it's just so bad. And that's what we have here. Verse 11, the man answered them, the man who healed me, the man that said to me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. This is really cool. Because this guy's going, he told me to. And he's kind of pushing it off now on Jesus. So what does that mean? Who, who, who's sinning here according to them? Whose, whose fault is this? Verse 12, they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. That is really an interesting verse there. It's a little bit puzzling. He he did not even know about Jesus. It speaks to maybe the depths of how much suffering he had. Lots of people had heard by now. Jesus had already been to Jerusalem. He had come back to Jerusalem for this passage. Words was spreading. This is not the first miracle, but this guy didn't. But this man was healed. This man was healed. He was up and he was walking. And I also saying that this man was confident. I want to be careful here. He wasn't confident about a lot of things. He wasn't confident who did it. He wasn't confident what it meant. He wasn't confident that the glory of God had come down upon him. This isn't a passage that's teaching us that the healing also equates to faith, like the passage that we read earlier. This isn't one of those where sometimes he says, get up and walk, or your sins are forgiven. What's the difference in those two? Which is harder? This isn't one of those. So there's several things that he's not confident in, but the man is confident that a miracle had been done on him. His day, just like that, had gotten better. He is up and walking. In John chapter 9, the more familiar story is the man born blind. You, You may be familiar with that one. The man blind from birth. And that story is, is, just, is just awesome, and people love that story. It's the one where Jesus spits in the mud and wipes it on his eyes and then tells him to wash it off and he can see. And what unfolds from that is just an incredible uh, open witness of he did it, man, that Jesus did. And the Pharisees also come at him, and they're saying, well, he wasn't supposed to do that, and you're not supposed to be doing that, and all this stuff's wrong with this miracle of Jesus. And he keeps going, man, I don't know what y'all think about it, and I don't know who did it, and I don't really know who he is, but that man Jesus healed me, and that's all I got to say about it. He knew, and it's just really encouraging to read that one. We don't really see that here in John chapter 5. We see a man healed. We see a man confident that he's been healed. What really stands out here are these religious people, these Pharisees that are upset about it. Look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. 
The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Hard to really understand what's going on there in verse 15. Maybe this guy wasn't so much a believer. Maybe this guy is a, is a Jew in the old sense like those Pharisees are and not, a, not, not really a believer in what's going on here. Maybe he's happy for the healing but not happy that it was Jesus. It's hard to tell. But what we do know here is yet again Jesus seeks him out. Jesus found him by the pool and healed him. He's healed and he's gone. Jesus finds him again in verse 14 and says, see, you are well. But notice here that it's in verse 14 that Jesus brings up sin. And I mentioned this earlier. Does he really have to go there? Is it not enough to just heal him and leave him at that? Why does Jesus say, sin no more? And I hope that your heart's right in tune with what's going on here. It's more important for us to be healed on the inside than it is on the outside. It's more important for us to be right spiritually than it is for us to be right physically. What would be better for this man to be walking here on earth and and not make it to heaven? I don't think so. You and I's bigger issue is what's going on inside of us. Where are we emotionally, morally, spiritually? How are we going to get our sins forgiven? How are we going to get right with God? A lot of times religious people will be so overly focused that we miss out on that. It's just do, 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 do. Here's what I do, here's what I do, here's what I do. And at days, it's I do good things and we feel good about ourselves. And this day, I do bad things and we feel horrible about ourselves. And that's what these Pharisees are dealing with here too. But a lot of times, those that are trying to be a witness will only, only, only ever talk about the, the spiritual side of it and ignore the physical side of it. And so there's a major disconnect. I want you to see that Jesus is talking to this man about his sin. But in this instance, Jesus had healed him physically. Make no mistake about it, this man, like all men, needs to be forgiven of his sins. That's the reason why I've been trying to connect being helpless and needy. Everybody sins. Everybody under heaven sins. Everybody in this church sins. Everybody in our neighborhood sins. Everybody sins. And to get to heaven and be in a relationship with God, our sins have to be forgiven. Jesus bringing up sin here is displaying even more mercy. And that he's found a guy that he's already loved on. He's found a guy he's already been good to. He's, he's found a guy that he's already shown mercy to and that he's got him walking. But he circles back and says, sin no more. Going in the direction of sin and godlessness. Going in the direction of not needing God. Going in the direction of saying, I don't need God's help in my life. Is surely a way to make things worse. And if you're able to act like it's not, that one day when you meet God, it surely will be. I'm thankful for this neat verse 14 where Jesus brings it back. Where we would have rejoiced and been thankful for the miracle and the healing that this man walked. Believers in Jesus would have been left going, what about his soul? Souls are what we should care about most. So in our pastoral prayer time today, I pray that we would be a witnessing church. That South Louisville, that this part of Jefferson County, that the Fairdale area would be impacted by loving, humble people trying to get people to think about their soul. Where are you going to go when you die? How's God think about that? This man was healed and confident. And Jesus engages him a second time. But we also can't help but see the Pharisees are not handling it well. They said to him, it's not lawful for you to do that. Really a bad look for these guys. A bad look for these religious people. J.C. Ryle commenting on this says, Many point out what an example this is of malevolent and malicious spirit of the Jews. Instead of asking, who healed you? They asked, who told you to carry your bed? They cared not for knowing what they might admire as a work of mercy, but what they might make the ground of an accusation. And how many are like them? 
They are always looking out for something to find fault with. Church, this is a word for us, is it not? Where our religion is distorted into we do what we do so that we feel good about who we are. That's not Christianity. And that's not the way to heaven. Our religion is to be none other than focused on Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And the work that he's doing in us may at times produce fruit and goodness in this world. We sure hope so. But it is always bringing us to our knees that we need mercy and forgiveness. Jesus is a savior to sinners. He is not a God to good people. He's not a God to self-righteous people. How ugly these religious people look as they deal with this man. Number one, he was helpless and needy. Number two, he was hopeful and desperate. Number three, he was healed and confident. And lastly, we shift now to Jesus who was healing and hated. That's our fourth and final point today. He was healing and he was hated. Look at what it says here in verse 16. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. So it tells us specifically here that the reason why these guys don't like Jesus and the reason why these guys attack Jesus and the reason why they single him out and the Bible uses the word persecuting here is because he's doing things on the Sabbath. And that bothers them so much that they've lost sight of the miracle and the goodness and the healing that has just happened, which are all things from God. They've lost sight of those. So they are so focused on their laws that they've made up. See, they've taken the laws of God and they've added their laws to them and they are uh, strict and they are judgmental with it and it's caused them now to miss what's even better and more important so that they're focused here and that's just really, 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 really wrong. Church people do this a lot. Fight over things that aren't worth fighting over. Create their own rules. We cannot let this be the case with us. We must be humble and repentant from this. We must keep the main thing, the main thing. We must always have our eyes on Jesus. We must be following him. It's embarrassing that this is what is going on with them. But admittedly here, that's what they're doing. Now, I want to say that if your ways can cause you to oppose God's ways, then you need to recognize your error. If your system will cause you to go against God's ways, you need to recognize your error. If the way you do it, if the way you were raised, if the way your church does church, if the way our church does church, if the way I preach causes us to go against God's ways, you, we, I need to recognize our error. There is only one God, and he is good over all, and he is perfect and good and holy. He is a father in heaven, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. You and I must do everything we can by humble repentance and faith in Christ to follow him. It is a word for us of how wrong these guys were. So what happens here, and the reason why I opened up the sermon today with this illustration about distraction and going down a wrong road, is what is, should be awesome about this healing and this man now walks has actually become these guys arguing about is it right or is it not right. And so it has been pushed off to, well, is it a sin for this man to walk or to pick up his bed? Or is it a sin for Jesus to heal? And we don't have time to cover it all today, but if you are looking for a really good, interesting, deep study, you can get into the philosophy of religion about does God work, how much does God work, and does God rest, right? When, Jesus, when God created, he worked six days and rested on the Sabbath, right? Right? So does that mean that God has to keep the Sabbath? And does that mean that he breaks the Sabbath? Oh, man, that's, that's like, that'll cause your head to hurt. But that's a good study if you want to get into it. In short, here's what you need to know. God never stops working. 
here Jesus says, this is not sin because I'm God, I'm equal to God, and if I'm doing the work that God's doing, it's okay for me to do it. And if I tell this guy to do the work that God's doing in this man, it's okay for him to do it. And this is consistent throughout all four Gospels when Jesus does What God is doing through him, it's okay for him to break the Sabbath in a way that only he gives approval to. It's fascinating. It's good. It's very encouraging. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Anybody that gets distracted from the work that God's doing in the world, healing a donkey that's stuck in a ditch... And tries to say that that's saving a donkey that's stuck in a ditch. And tries to say that that sin is missing the point of how God is working in the world. And the same thing is going on here. Another commentator wanting to prove this point says, Jesus insists that whatever factors justify God's continuous work from creation on also, also justify his actions. In the minute circumstances of the immediate crisis... The healed man is justified in carrying his mat because Jesus has ordered him to. And in doing so, Jesus is working just like the Father. Just as the fact that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath can be used to defend the actions of Jesus' disciples throughout the Gospels, so the fact that, the Jesus, so the fact that Jesus' works fall into the same category as his Father's works serves to exonerate the man who carries his mat. Jesus has not done anything wrong here. Jesus has not broken God's law here. And these people are upset about it. It's their rules that they don't like. Jesus was healing this man, and he was hated for it. Look back at the Bible. Verse 16 says, this is why they were persecuting him. But look down to verse 18, our final verse. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. So that's not just persecution. Now they want to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's an incredible verse. If you underline or you highlight or you circle, John 5, 18 is a key verse. We have here that everybody is understanding, even his opponents are understanding, he's claiming to be equal to God. This is one of the points that John wants you and I to believe. If you're here today, you need to believe that Jesus is the God-man. Chapter 1, verse 1 told us that Jesus is God. He begins the gospel in the prologue by teaching us that Jesus is God. We're five chapters in now, and everybody's recognizing Jesus thinks he's God. Jesus claims to be God. Jesus is doing things that God does. And when they try to oppose him, he says, don't try to oppose God. This is why they persecute him, and this is why they want to kill him. And give us a few chapters, we'll get down the road, and this is why they will kill him. And when they do kill him, it'll be the love of God being fulfilled for the sins of the world, for you and I. And we will believe it. We will rejoice at the cross of Christ where he died for me And for you, and we will believe it. I want to ask you here today to believe here in John chapter 5 that this man is your Savior. This man is the good one who does good to people. He sees the helpless. He sees the needy. He sees the desperate. And he steps into that to bring the answer to life. Would you be forgiven of your sins and trust in Christ? Would you welcome the God to life who gives forgiveness of sins? I've mentioned a few times here that there is a warning for us. This warning is going to play out now every single Sunday for a long time because the Pharisees are not going to give in. They're going to be relentless in opposing Jesus. They're going to tear into him over and over again. They're going to try to find fault in him. They're going to keep telling him that he's wrong. Several years ago, 10, 12, 14 years ago, I was doing a funeral for an older lady. And the word was that she was so involved in church and she had done this many things and she had taught Sunday school and I didn't know that much about her, but that's what they told me. And then I went to meet with the family to plan the service. And the family said, as I met with them, they said, look, here's what she wanted, here's what we'll do, these are songs she liked and we'll play all that. 
I said, all right, well, we'll do it. We have service, Donna. I said, okay. Let's just keep it short and sweet, and we'll get this over with. And I said, do any of you all want to speak? Broke my heart in that moment. The children and the grandchildren were all like, no. I ain't, got, I ain't got anything to say. I said, well, tell me more. I mean, was she in church her whole life and all that? And they said, man, what people thought about her at church may be one thing. And God, he said things like this, and God rest her soul. The way she was at home made us want nothing to do with church. That's the reason why we don't go to church. I don't go to church. My wife don't go to church. My kids don't go to church. He's like, We don't want anything to do with it, man. If you could see how ugly she was and how mean she was to us at home, we lived that our whole lives. I was devastated. I was shook. We read John chapter 5 here today of people that are very similar to that. They raise their hands to show people when they give. They talk about church. Like they're the ones that know God. But they're crooked. They don't reflect him. Church, I want it to be a warning to us that that would not be the case. I want it to be the case for us as a church that we are focused on the main things. That you and I are needy before God. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know how wayward your kids and grandkids might be, but I'm going to tell you this in all sincerity. They're not more far off than you are. We all need God the same. And our love and mercy toward them ought to reflect his love and mercy toward us. And if our church is going to get busy like we do and do a lot for people around here, we're walking the thin line, aren't we? Wonder how many people say, man, they do this for us, but got to be careful with that. And that's why I was encouraged this week, and I want to share this with you all. The school year ends this week, and the Fairdale High School yearbook came out this week. We got a separation of church and state in this country, and so ch- churches don't do a whole lot with the schools, or so they say. But in the Fairdale High School yearbook, there's a page here for football. And they asked one of the star players right here. He was named District Player of the Year, best player on the team. He wants to continue his career. It's his dream to play in college. And so they asked him, would you share a memorable moment from the season that impacted your performance And the team's overall success. And right here in this, at a school that has 1,400 kids, he said, the pregame meals and the lessons from the pastor down at the church, Fairdale Baptist Church, it says right here, are what he remembers about a successful season. Somebody sent me that this week. I had not seen it, and I rejoiced. That's a long way from being our biggest goal. Before the football team arrives week after week, we huddle up and pray down there. Not that they'd like the meal and that we'd make the yearbook. We actually never dreamed of making the yearbook. But we pray that they would know know Jesus. But that's a step in the right direction of us representing God for who he really is. May you and I take it to heart on the streets and in our home. To reflect God for what he's really like. You know what happened in John chapter 5? A good savior came along. Saw a helpless and needy man. And he healed him. Praise the Lord. And then later on. He engages him about his sin. If they're not cool with that. Something's wrong with them. May you and I. Be about the real Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for John chapter 5 and yet the long story that it brings up to us. Father, we pray that you and I, we pray, dear God, that we would hear the warnings about how wrong they are but embrace the goodness of our Savior, Jesus. God, we ask your blessing on us. 
that you would work in us, that we would be believers, that we would be followers of Christ. God, we thank you for how you're working in Janet, and we see her baptism, and we pray, God, for all of us, that we would long to be following you and trusting in Christ. Father, help us to not be the hypocritical, judgmental ones in the world, but to be the broken and needy ones who have trusted in Christ. Father, we pray now that you would humble us and lead us to Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. As we sing this final song, let's have a a time of response. If you're here today and you're thinking, I want to be baptized,